For some time now, over the past couple of months, uh, we've been on a journey reading through Genesis. We've been on a journey reading through Genesis and Exodus, and today we are in Exodus uh, chapter 32, and we are reading verses 1 through 14. You can either follow in your Bible or you can either listen. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us. Who shall go before us? As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it into a mold, and cast an image of a cow. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and bought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshiped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them. And you and I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring to on his people. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's holy word. Let us pray. Dear Lord, sometimes it's so easy when it feels like you're not with us for us to get ourselves in some stuff. In this moment, as we approach your word, may you have something at the table for all of us. Give us focus and attention to sit still long enough to hear your words, Lord, and bless us and remind us about showing and sharing the love with others. Thank you for inviting us to this space on this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I'm using for a sermonic theme today, check your anxiety. Check your anxiety. This year, I dare say, has been a high for Americans We've seen all kinds of things happen. I would say that this year has been a high for anxiety for our country. After the shooting this summer of Jacob Blake, the protesters hit the streets in Kenosha, Wisconsin for days. 
In a heat of protest over police brutality, enraged civilians marched the street in protest. Do you know often when people protest, there's so much that is there. There's so much feeling. There's so many opinions. There's so much thought. You're bringing all these people together who are feeling on a high. There are a lot of people there, there to protest. Maybe people there for other reasons. There are a lot of police there to bring some kind of order, even though sometimes the whole incident was incited by police activity in the first place. It's a delicate balance seeing how all these people with all these actions are gathered in one space. And then there are others, often many of us, that are somewhere in the middle. And then there are others who come who decide that their country needs protecting. All kinds of people show up at protest events, which often leads to them being violent. On the third day of the protest in Kenosha, Wisconsin, Kyle Rittenhouse decided to go and protect civilians at a gas station that called for help. He heard this man calling and saying he was afraid that his business would be taken down. And so Kyle responded at some point very late in the night while he was standing protecting. The rioters turned on him. Perhaps they saw his weapons. Perhaps they looked at him and knew that he was not an ally. But they began to chase him, and they struck him, and they hit him. And at some moment, while Kyle is being attacked with an AR-15 on his person, he shoots multiple times, leaving two people dead and one injured. Kyle is 17 years old, and Kyle lives in Antioch, Illinois. That's our state. I don't want to go down the road of whether it's legal for a 17-year-old to own a firearm because we know that it is legal. And I won't, don't want to go down the road about where were his parents and what was he doing and why was a 17-year-old operating a vehicle and in a whole nother state. We resist these roads because as much as we do know, we honor, there's a lot that we don't know, that we don't know about cow that we don't know about each other, that we don't know about our world. Already a half a million has been raised in defense for Kyle and his legal representation. There are clearly many who feel like Kyle should get off, he should not be charged, and that he fired in self-defense. And yet there are many others on the other side who feels like he should be charged and he should be found guilty. But there's one thing that both sides have agreed on, and that was that Kyle was scared. Kyle was out there pretty much by himself. He witnessed the protest firsthand. He saw some of the protesters coming down the street. They went fine. And then as the night grew on, another set of protesters coming down the street. He saw the damages done to neighborhood. He was even part of a cleanup crew. And he heard a guy beg for help for his store, and Kyle decided to get involved. And a lot of people decided to get involved on different sides, but Kyle decided to get involved and protect this business owner's store. And with his back against the wall, he made a split-second decision to shoot. Maybe he made a decision to shoot to protect his own life. But this I do know, people do not make good decisions when their backs are against the wall. We are living in anxious times. The White House has COVID. The debates continue to be more of a fiasco. There's all kind of memes about bugs. And there's no real conversation on the leadership and the issues leading to more and more craziness. People who never voted are voting. Mail and votes are happening. The elections carry their own anxiety as our country is very much torn. We pray, but we also do not know what will happen even beyond the elections. Our souls are weary. Folks are gearing up for a second wave of COVID. Many of our seniors and people with compromised immune systems have locked themselves away. 
Schools are remote with no end in sight. As parents post pictures of kids sitting in newly created classrooms in their own houses in attempt to foster spaces of learning. The tension between the parties are at an all time high as people draw lines that have caused loved ones to say bye and still people are dying and sick. And for the month of October, we have created this space to grieve, to create a space that we can grieve. We're trying to live our best lives and we are anxious. We are living in anxious times. And this is where we enter the biblical text. The Israelites were in a liminal space of finding it hard in Moses' absence to be content. Moses had been gone to be present with God and they were anxious. By the way, have you guys noticed that Moses did a lot of going away to meet with God, to spend time with God? Every time you look around, he's going off to meet with God, leaving all these folks to wait until he gets back. Most of you know that in my family, we recently extended it and we have a puppy in our house now. I have to tell you that my attempts at bathroom, tr bathroom training are not going as well as I expected. I was feeling good the other day. I've got the feed times down. He doesn't just get to eat anytime, but he has a set time when he eats. I'm excited about nighttime when we put him in the crate. No accidents there, but it's this daytime thing. I was excited, I got up, I was like, I'm gonna be on top of it today. I mopped the floor, everything, got the house in ship shape order. Hadn't fed him anything. Didn't think about it much, but I heard something slurping and found out he was in the bathroom toilet. <laughs> Another thing to cover, now I have to close the bathroom door, close the toilet. But I find that puppies need a lot of attention. They need a lot of care. They need a lot of reassurance. He needs to be rubbed and touched and checked on and loved and coached and trained and rewarded. He's a lot of rewards for good behavior. And I think the Israelites here, they needed a lot of watching. The Israelites needed a lot of checking in. The Israelites needed a lot of reassurance and affirmation that they were okay out here in the wilderness that they were going to be okay. Maybe, maybe if we're honest, some of us are vulnerable too. Maybe if we're really honest, we could use some reassurance now too. It may feel like God has left the building and you find yourself anxious. Think about it for a minute. They had left Egypt, they were in the middle of nowhere, and Moses is gone. At my former church, there were two kids who came up to me one Sunday and announced they were going to Spain to run with the bulls. Headed to do what? For what? <laughs> going where? To do what? I had never heard of this fiasco. <laughs> but upon listening to them, I began to gather information. And I learned that every year in Spain, except for this year, that there's an activity called running with the bowls. You have to be over 18 and you can't be intoxicated. I wonder why. <laughs> and so people from all over the world come to this event and they run 957 yards. And the runners are not allowed to run the first 50 yards. It's like they're given a handicap. So they're 50 yards ahead. And then they sound off the bell and the bulls take off, and the people take off. And they say that about 50 to 100 people get injured every year. But since 1915, only 15 people have died. Now imagine, imagine the bulls running and you running. There's got to be some kind of adrenaline thing that happens when you do this. It's just you and a bunch of people and bulls running. Well, at first it's you running because you've got a 50 yard gain. But at some point, the bulls catch up with you and it's the bulls and the people. And I imagine anxiety like this, 
The people are trying to run faster than the bulls. I imagine anxiety is like running with the bulls, and like the bulls, the anxiety is running us. Moses left the people, and in his absence, their anxiety ran them to the point that they started worshiping idols. And do we remember from last week, commandment number one, do not worship idols. And we remember from last week, commandment number one, do not worship idols. Remember when people have their backs up against the wall, they do not often make good decisions. Last week we learned as we were looking at the Ten Commandments that an idol is something that you prioritize as very important that should not be as important as you're making it. Last week we learned that idols could be fame, it could be property, it could be money, it could be power. For the Israelites, it was another guy. It was a golden calf. But what might idols be for us today? What might be the idols of our time? At a famous restaurant in New York City, they found that their reviews were getting cited for slower and slower service. This was an upscale restaurant, and they wanted to know why they were getting reviews. They were saying that their service was slower and slower. They had hired more staff. They had scaled back the menu. They had done everything they could. And so they decided to hire a firm to help them solve the mystery because they wanted to have excellent reviews, and they were known for a top stellar restaurant. So what the firm did was they looked at their surveillance cameras and they found something interesting. They found in 2004 that the average customer that came in was there for one hour. But 10 years later in 2014, the average visit was two hours. And what do you think caused the average person's visit to go from one hour up to two hours? Do you know what doubled that time? So in 2004, when they looked at the tapes, it took eight minutes on average for people to order off the menu. But in 2014, before they even ordered off the menu, they took out their phones. Seven out of 45 customers needed help connecting to the Wi-Fi in the restaurants. They found that in 2014, it took people 21 minutes to order, compared to eight minutes in 2004. In 2004, the food would get delivered in six minutes. People would eat, they'd get their checks. The check would be delivered back to them in five minutes, and they were done eating in one hour. Three minutes gets taken on taking pictures in 2014. First, they take about three minutes to take pictures of their food. Then another four minutes to take pictures of the people with the food. Then another three minutes to get the waitress or the server to take pictures of the whole group. I know this is not too far off the beaten path because about three years ago I went with a younger group of people. Somehow our honorary got invited. I was hanging out with a bunch of 30 year olds. And we went to a restaurant where you get that unlimited supply of meat. We got to the restaurant. First of all, they didn't arrive on time. <laughs> so I was there waiting for the rest of the birthday party to arrive. But then I was amazed and when we got there, how many pictures they took. And as if that wasn't enough, after we ate our meal, the whole party disappeared for 20 minutes. They were all over the restaurant taking pictures. So I know that this restaurant is not telling a story. So from 2004 to 2014, now the person stays longer, and yet they give the restaurant the review for being slower. I wonder what our idols would be today. 
I wonder if technology would be one of our idols. The psychological land front is even showing that now there are withdrawal symptoms when people don't have their technology. They're showing with kids without their technology, they're irritable. They're unable to focus. Could technology be one of our idols? Remember over in the New Testament, a rich, wise businessman comes to Jesus and asks, how do I live a right life, a good life? So far, his life had been stellar. He had done all the things he should do. He thought he would pass the test. And he goes to Jesus and he says, what must I do to continue on this path that I'm on? He's confident. He's sure of himself. And Jesus says to him, sell all you have and give it away. And there's this long silence. There's this foreboding in the air. And you can feel the heaviness of this request. The man hangs his head and he walks away. He's unable to part with his stuff. Could another be, idol be our material possessions, our things? What are the idols of our day? God gets mad with the Israelites and Moses reasons with God and God calms down. What's interesting here is God is going off and God is going in on the Israelites and he issues a few threats and Moses reasons with God and God changes God's mind. In fact, this is the only time in the text where God changes God's mind. Enough is enough feels God. While me and Moses are talking, you all are worshiping idols. You all are buying more stuff. While Moses and me are talking, you all are medicating away your anxiety. You all are CBD in heaven your anxiety away. You all are on Amazon every day. You all are buying larger and larger screen sized TVs. You all are eating good and getting bigger. You all are turning everywhere and turning every way except me. And enough is enough. He was frustrated with the Israelites. Like a puppy, they kept getting into stuff. Part of the anxiety can be caused when we wonder who is in control. Who's got their hand on the wheel? And for the Israelites, while Moses and God are away, it felt like no one had their hand on the wheel. But we know that isn't true. Because this is the God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Over and over, we've been told this this whole Sandmark. This is the God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Sometimes you got to check yourself. I brought you up out of Egypt and I didn't bring you out to leave you here. Sometimes we even know it. Haven't you been with yourself one day and you're like, man, I got to check myself. Sometimes we have to check ourselves. Okay, come on. Come on. Some days you haven't looked at yourself and said, okay, okay, I got to check myself. I'm not a scent person. I'm really not, but I love certain natural scents. And among them is eucalyptus and peppermint. So anyway, I'm not a Bath and Body Works kind of person either. But I love their aromatherapy line, and they have one that's called Relax. And in the Relax, they've got spearmint and eucalyptus, and it smells heavenly. I don't know about you all, but every day you usually use your regular soap, but every now and then there's a special time, and you pull out your special stuff. Every now and then I pull out my special relaxing body wash and lotion. It smells heavenly, and it smells so good, and I feel relaxed. I don't know if it's working or not, but it feels like I'm relaxing as I inhale those scents in the shower or if I'm taking a bath. So I was going on this special trip and I decided to pack my relaxing aromatherapy body wash and gel. I got it in my suitcase and I got to the airport and there's a thing called TSA. And I got one of those travel on suitcases. You know how it works, so you don't have to pay to pack, you know, to send your suitcase. And so I go through two ESA. I haven't even thought about the three ounces. And of course, I'm one of those people. You know when you get the signal, you're like, okay, they got me. They're about to check my suitcase. 
So I pull over to the side, I wait for someone to be free. They open up my suitcase and they put their hands on my aromatherapy. I'm like, no, no. I plead. But unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, the TSA employees have been trained to adhere to a rule 200%, and they don't care if you cry, they don't care if you're sad, they don't care how you look, no kind of manipulation or conning is going to work. And they took it. They checked it. And that's what's amazing at the airport. There's certain things, no matter what, that get checked at TSA. Sometimes we need to check our anxiety. We can acknowledge it, but it doesn't have to run us. And like TSA, we can check it. Check yourself, check your anxiety. When you go to certain functions that are nice and the weather is colder and you arrive at the event, often there will be a service booth area that allows you to check your coat, that allows you to check your hat, that allows you to drop off your gear and they give you a little piece of paper and they maybe staple or put another piece of paper with the same number on it. But it allows you to check your stuff so you no longer have to worry about it. You can mingle, you can enjoy the event, you can enjoy the function and you don't have to worry about your baggage. You don't have to worry about your extra stuff. You know it'll be there, you can go back and get it and when you check out, you give them the little receipt that you have. Likewise, for today, we need to check our anxiety. Over the coming weeks, we need to check our anxiety. For this upcoming election, we need to be able to check our anxiety. We are living in a season where we need to be able to check our anxiety. Take a break from it. You can always go back and get it. You don't have to log around that extra weight. You do not have to be fumbling with your gloves and your coat and carrying all that anxiety around. You can step over to the service desk and you can check your anxiety. If I had been Moses, I would have told the Israelites, check yourself. But as you all can see, I'm not Moses. But with the authority I do have, I want to encourage us to check ourselves. From time to time, I've watched people do some crazy things over the past year. I've watched people kind of go a little too far. I've watched people on the cliff. I've watched people take in news and start to let the news run them. And sometimes we have to check ourselves. We've got to check our anxiety. We've got to check the spaces that we are in. We are living in anxious time, but we don't have to let the bulls run us. We don't have to let the anxiety let up run us. Because remember, we serve the God who brought the Israelites out of Egypt and the God that will bring us out too. Let us check our anxiety. Let us check ourselves. We're going to be okay. Amen.